Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. CPI aftermath. Fed officials offer mixed commentary on the outlook for rates after U.S. inflation comes in hotter than expected. Sterling weakens and gilts extend, well, gains as U.K. inflation falls more than forecast in January, driven by lower fuel prices. Plus, Barclays slumps more than 8% as fourth quarter earnings miss estimates across most divisions. The U.K. bank is planning a share buyback of half a billion pounds. Now, first thing is first. Good morning, everyone. Let's check on the markets. Quite a lot going on in terms of gilts, but also Treasury yields. We did have uh, that important inflation print from the U.S. pretty much in line with expectations. The U.K. inflation also pretty much in line, but of course it's the outlook on interest rates that's moving markets and investors weighing the impact of what that means for monetary policy. They're also digesting a lot of results from major companies. I was looking at the two-year Treasury yield. I don't know if we have that up, but overall the, uh, you know, the two-year actually remaining near the highest level since November, and then a couple of other uh, quirks that we're watching, of course, is sterling oil uh, falling for a second day after an industry estimate had pointed to a large build. The other thing we need to watch out for is the People's Bank of China adding more cash into the financial system to meet a rebound in loan demand after the nation eased COVID restrictions. Now, there's not a huge difference whether you're sitting in Italy or whether you're sitting in Germany or France. So let's get the European map to see if uh, there are um, countries that are doing much better than others. Overall, they're, they're pretty much range bound, so I would say they're between being flat and maybe gaining two tenths of eight percent. So some Fed officials have stressed the need for further interest rate increases to help tame inflation after U.S. data came in hotter than expected, slightly hotter than expected. Now, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond President Thomas Barkin is one of those keeping the door open to more hikes. We may or may not uh, choose to take rates up further if inflation continues to persist, but we'll have to see what happens. If inflation settles, uh, maybe we don't go quite as far, but if inflation persists, at levels well above our, our target, maybe we'll have to do more. Well, joining us now is Mike Bell, JP Morgan Asset Management, a global market strategist in Bloomberg's Xenia Galuchko. So thank you both for joining us. Mike, let's start off with you. What did you learn from inflation yesterday in the U.S.? I don't know whether it's the commentary that is moving markets rather than the inflation print. It feels like it for sure. Yeah, I don't think there was a huge amount of extra data in what we saw from the inflation print. I mean, I think ultimately the key question that markets need to know the answer to is when's unemployment going up? Do we see the labour market break this year? And you look at things like the conference board's leading economic indicator. Every time in history they've been this week, unemployment then goes up, you get a recession. So I think the market expects that. And if we get a recession, that's why we within the thing the market is pricing in the rate cuts that you can see priced into the curve. But if you don't get that crack in the labour market, unemployment doesn't go up and then the rate cuts don't come. That, I think, is the biggest risk to markets this year, not whether the Fed peak at five, five and a half, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter so much. The key question okay. is, by the end of next year, are rates somewhere near three or are they still at five or even six, seven percent? Yeah, and I hear this more and more, Xenia, right? The idea that actually the, it's, it's kind of like a bifurcation. It either goes well or it doesn't, and that will change everything. What time, what kind of time frame do we need to look at to understand the lagging effect of monetary policy so far? Because that seems a key question here. Absolutely. So I think if you look at the stock market, it's definitely thinking of the year ahead in general. So stocks have rallied tremendously, both in the U.S. and Europe and China, on these expectations that the Fed will eventually pivot this year. Now, if we look at the bond market, especially after the U.S. CPI data, we see a completely different reaction. So the bond market slumped yesterday, and obviously yields are much higher because uh, the bond market is pricing in more rate hikes and them staying higher for longer. So the stocks seem to be much more optimistic than the bond market at the moment. And so your hunch feeling, Mike, in that very good question, what happens with employment? Again, is there a timeline? How much of a slowdown will we see because of the hikes in 2022? Yeah, history suggests that you should see unemployment rising this year. You look at most of the key uh, economic indicators, things like the ISM manufacturing new order survey, the existing home sales, they're all at very weak levels that historically precede a rise in unemployment. So I think that we're just in that point in the cycle where the leading economic data is weak and then there's a bit of a lag before it feeds through into a rise in unemployment. And so I do think the Fed will be able to deliver cuts as the market expects. But the risk to that is that we also see 
job openings relative to the number of unemployed people at very high levels compared with history. So that's the kind of small risk that maybe actually you see Labour hoarding and you don't get the rise in unemployment that history suggests that you normally would do. So uh, what does that mean for what you're... Is there anything that you'd be strategically positioning yourself on when it comes to Treasuries but also bonds? Yeah, I actually think that the bond market is doing a pretty good job of pricing what's going to happen to rates. Uh, I think in the UK there's a chance that actually rates need to come down a bit more over the next two to three years than the market's pricing because I think that the UK housing market is going to struggle if rates stay um, elevated. Uh, what's your take on this, Xenia? So what are you looking at th through all of our reporting and also th this idea that actually, th you know, services inflation is really the one to watch out for? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think it's very much about stock picking this year. So more and more fund managers are uh, really rejoicing this year because they think that it's their time for stock picking. So I think cyclical and value sectors are going to uh, continue to do much better than growth because obviously higher yields will continue to pressure tech stocks. And then these cheaper cyclicals like automakers, like banks that benefit directly from higher rates will continue doing quite well. So this is uh, the attention that is being paid to. Okay, let's also look at some of the specific movers that we have today. So we have LVMH, we have Caring, we have a lot of the, the luxury sector, then we have Barclays down some 8% and we have Glencore. So here with us, Joe Easton from our equities team with the stocks on the move. Joe, what do you have? That's right, Fran. So as you mentioned, Barclays shares getting slammed today, down 8%, the most in almost a year for that company as their fixed income revenue misses expectations their net interest margins are weak and a £500 million buyback really not enough to appease analysts today. That stock also weighing on peers like Lloyd's and also NatWest as well. Some of the other stocks I'm looking at, as you mentioned, some of the luxury firms, we've got carrying it today. That stock actually opened down around 4%. Given some concern around Gucci not coming back online quick enough over in China and also some of the concern around Balenciaga sales dropping following those controversial adverts that we saw in November. Recovering though as analysts say that perhaps the worst is now behind them and also that valuation pretty cheap. A couple of other ones I'll just go on to quickly. Carrefour and Ahold, two big grocers, one in France and one in Amsterdam. Both of them seeing the benefit today of rising food prices and also managing to control their margins in terms of the wages and energy costs. Carrefour announcing a buyback of almost a billion dollars and a hold looking to save around a billion dollars in costs, spurring hopes that they could actually increase their buyback at the next report. And as you see on the screen there, both of those grocery stocks rising sharply in European trading today. Joe, thank you so much. Joe Easton there with a very nice roundup of equities. On the move, Mike, what does this mean for A, where you want to be invested in, but also in general just value investing? Yeah, I think if I look at equities at the moment, my base case is that we've seen the lows for equity markets, but we've obviously rallied a fair way off of those lows now. Um, so I'm kind of looking around global equities for the bits of markets that haven't got back to their prior peaks and are still pricing in a fair bit of bad news. So okay. China, for example, still a long way off of its highs. Uh, some of the mid and small cap stocks in the UK still look quite beaten up. Um, and then in the US, the banks still, I think, look quite attractive, down more than 20% from their highs. Uh, it's amazing when you look at the banks. I mean, if you don't give back to shareholders in a meaningful way, or if it's already priced in or telegraphed, you're going to get slammed. Well, there's the thing. That's why banking uh, sector and energy are giving back through buybacks in a major way at the moment. They're trying to attract those shareholders because obviously earnings, especially for the energy sector, are starting to come down. Analysts are saying that the fourth quarter was the peak in terms of energy earnings. So they need a way to attract these. And then other sectors uh, in commodities, in uh, other value and cyclical sectors are also starting to pay out those buybacks and dividends in order to attract investors back to those shares. Uh, Mike, what are you doing with the luxury sector? So I know it's probably a China play that you mentioned, but if you look at LVMH and carrying, it's just wildly different fortunes. I think obviously it benefits in a world where you get China reopening. They've accumulated huge amounts of savings in excess of what they did pre-COVID, something like an extra trillion dollars of savings. So that's, I think, going to drive a pretty strong rebound in Chinese domestic demand. Yeah. The question, of course, is looking for which stocks have already priced that in, because you've seen a pretty strong rally in some of the luxury goods sectors. Uh, what do you do with energy, the outstanding performer of, of 2022? 
Yeah, I'm more inclined to look at the bits of the market that did badly okay. and haven't recovered rather than the stuff that's already done extremely well, such as the energy stocks. I mean, where do you look at energy? I mean, the, the energy versus ESG space, and we had Glencore today, I think, with record profits. It is what, yeah, you wonder where we are in 12 months. Absolutely, yes. So energy sector is likely to come under pressure this year just because of, it, of its outstanding performance last year and because earnings are starting to come under pressure. Oil prices and gas prices have come down in the past few months and they're already starting to exercise pressure on the margins of these companies. So like we mentioned, these buybacks could be a way for these companies to attract shareholders to them, but this will be a much more challenging year because commodities are coming down. All right, thank you both for joining us. Mike Bell there, JP Morgan Asset Management, Global Market Strategist, and Bloomberg's Xenia Galuchko. Coming up, more from our interview with the Canadian Defence Minister, Anita Anand, who will discuss, of course, the latest on military aid to Ukraine. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, we have a lot going on, of course, uh, with the defense. Uh, the Canadian defense minister earlier on was speaking to uh, our Maria Tadeo. Meanwhile, the EU is proposing a new sanctions package against Moscow that would include targeting assets held by the Russian Central Bank. Now, the draft proposal seen by Bloomberg also says the bloc's executive arm is looking to strengthen reporting obligations on frozen assets linked to sanctioned individual companies and of course individuals so joining us now uh, bloomberg's maria today who's in brussels maria thank you for joining us great interview with the defense minister of canada uh, ursula von der Leyen has just spoken in strasbourg what do we know about the extra sanctions uh, yes, Francine, and as you say, it's a very busy day. You have the, the NATO uh, meeting happening at the same time. You have the, the head of the commission also speaking and now confirming there's a new package of sanctions that is underway and that will be announced uh, worth about 11 billion euros against Russia. We were expecting this to some extent. We knew that the European Union wanted to send this political message. The more the war goes on, the more painful this is going to get on the economic front uh, for Russia. And you also have the top diplomat speaking at the same time in the same morning. A lot of this really goes to the urgency, this new sense of urgency that we see both on the sanctions but also on the battlefield when it comes to the war in Ukraine. As for the commission today, they say a lot of the new sanctions will look into export ban technologies. They want to deprive uh, the Russian war machine. We've seen the drones that continue to attack uh, Ukraine. There are references to, to Iran here. There's a big question mark, however, and this is a story that we reported overnight that in some ways is the key in this debate, which is the frozen assets of the Russian Central Bank, the companies and the individuals that have been frozen now for a year. Now, we are reporting the Commission is looking for ways to get in touch with European banks to have them report what kind of transactional relationship they had in the past to try to figure out the value of the assets that are here in the European Union. And Francine, this goes back to a much bigger and fundamental question to some extent, which is, is there a possibility where the European Union decides we're going to confiscate the assets, use them, invest them, and give that proceed to Ukraine for the reconstruction of Ukraine? That plays well with but the Maria Eastern European countries. Yes, go ahead. No, who, who exactly is it targeting? Like, this is the first story that I read, and, you know, congratulations to Alberto for, for getting that scoop. But it's aiming to make banks divulge frozen Russian assets. Like, how many are there and from who? Yes, and Francine, to be very honest, I don't think they know in, in great detail. And that's why they're doing this. That's why they want to now reach out to, to banks and essentially say, can we figure out what's going on here and what's the value of the assets? You want to say or you want to start a debate about using Russian frozen assets to help Ukraine. First of all, you need to know how many who has them and what kind of transactional uh, relationship they have. But beyond that and the detail, and this is going to be a very long process. That's very clear if ever it happens. Because remember, there's lawyers that say if you do that, the G7 jurisdiction is out of the window. But what it shows, however, is that this debate has gone from we can't even talk about it, to now let's just test the waters and do some prep work in terms of what it can mean or may or could look like uh, in the future. So it does show that this, this idea of why don't we make Russia pay, not our taxpayers, is to some extent gaining ground as the bill gets bigger from Ukraine. So NATO defense ministers, uh, Maria, are also meeting in Brussels on Ukraine. What do we know about what they'll decide? 
Well, they're meeting for a day two, and, and Francine, beyond that, and of course, we're talking about the financial ramifications for this, but the war is also going on, and that was a message uh, yesterday from the head of NATO. The spring invasion, it may not be a spring situation, it may be happening now as we speak, and according to NATO, what they see is that Russia has now fully mobilized thousands and thousands of units to the east of Ukraine. They're willing to accept a very high casualty rate. That means you have a lot of soldiers that die, but if that helps you move, they're willing to take that pain, and the problem is, for Ukraine, that means constant engagement. It means constant use of ammunition, constant use of weapons. So we talk about the fighter jets and the tanks, but there's also a real question about the ammunition, but also the production. If Ukraine burns through this very fast, the West needs to come up with ways to make them faster, not just for Ukraine, but also their own stocks. Maria, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo out of Brussels with the very latest. Now, coming up, the UK's inflation rate slowed more than expected, but still remains stubbornly in double digits. We unpack the data next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, time for our daily UK segment. And UK inflation fell more than expected, with prices rising 10.1% in the year to January. Now, that makes it the third consecutive month that the inflation rate has fallen. The figures remain stubbornly high, more than five times above the Bank of England's target level. So, joining us now is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden to break all the data down for us. Lizzie, I mean, this, I guess, is, is welcoming at the margins, but it doesn't mean that we're going to go down f as fast as Bank of England was hoping. True. And if you look at the market reaction, the pounds fallen on this data, seemingly on the premise that this bigger fall than faster fall in inflation means you're going to have fewer hikes from the Bank of England. But, as you say, it's still more than five times the Bank of England's target. We're still in double digits. And if you compare this figure to the US, France, Germany, as you say, the UK's inflation is stubbornly high. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, to his credit, has acknowledged that this morning. He says the fight is far from over because it validates him prioritising the fight against inflation. The good news, if I can bring some of that out, is the biggest drivers of the fall were food and fuel, which is what poorer Brits are spending on. And also you saw that services inflation fell, even core services inflation, and that's what the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England looks at to gauge how much companies are passing on higher wage bills and higher energy costs. So that's reassuring for the MPC. So what are we expecting from Bank of England? I know that we're expecting one other rate hike in March, but that's now, I guess, on the table. Yeah, and I mean, there's a debate between economists whether you get one more hike or two. Our economists at Bloomberg Economics say that this print today means that the pause is on the horizon. But if you look at uh, WIRP, W-I-R-P function on the terminal, you can see that money markets have reacted aggressively to this. They've pared back their bets for where peak inflation will be. So it was 4.69% in September. It's now 4.55%. Well, oh, oh, it, it was on 4.69% on Tuesday and now it's 4.55%. Um, in terms of how the Bank of England is going to weigh up these numbers, I actually think that there are parts of the BOE that would look past these headline numbers right. and look at more niche data points like the Inflation Attitude Survey, the uh, Decision Makers Panel because they're focused on inflation expectations for households and businesses. I was speaking to a senior BOE official who said businesses know that people have got pandemic savings. They're going to wait until people stop buying the goods before they cut the prices. Um, so really, it comes down to the in, uh, inflation expectations for some corners of the BOE. Yeah, I would, I would urge everyone to go and also look at what Dan Hansen and Anna Andrade wrote today, saying, look, the key detail in the CPI was definitely the sharp fall in services inflation. And they think if we have a bit more support along that trajectory for, of course, the labor market would be enough for the central bank to keep rates on hold on March 23rd. That's the other big one. And then there was, there was of course, there's still the, the labor uh, disputes and, um, I guess, questions on whether the government would backdate some of the pay rises. Yeah, indeed. And that's uh, a, a story from our colleague Joe Mays today. I mean, this print today, 
works two ways, doesn't it? Because while you've got high inflation swallowing up pay rises, you could say the bank it validates the Chancellor's argument that you're prioritising yeah. inflation, that you can't be giving in to the union's demands, but you could also say that it gives the union's ammo to give them the pay rises to deal with the cost of living. It works both ways. It does. But Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Broden there with the very latest on that inflation data. Now we'll be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. in our half an hour special. We're also getting some breaking news out of Lufthansa. We hope you're not skiing. We hope you don't have to get back or leave today. Lufthansa is saying that IT system problems are causing some widespread cancellation. So if you have to go to the airport or if you're coming home, for a flight, just check with your airline carrier. Coming up, U.S. inflation cools slightly, but Fed officials warn the fight against inflation may need to heat up. We have more on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. CPI aftermath. So Fed officials offer mixed commentary on the outlook for rates after U.S. inflation comes in hotter than expected. Sterling weakens and gilts extend gains as U.K. inflation falls more than forecasts in January, driven by lower fuel prices. Plus, Barclays slums as fourth quarter earnings miss estimates across most divisions, but the U.K. lender is planning a share buyback at, of half a billion pounds. Now, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, some Fed officials have floated the idea of even higher rates to help tackle inflation after data showed U.S. consumer prices rising higher than expected. Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia President Patrick Harker believes the end is in sight. We are reaching a point where we're, we'll have done enough. Exactly where that is, we're going to have to let the data dictate that. It's going to be above 5% in the Fed funds rate. How much above 5 it's going to depend uh, a lot on what we're seeing. Well, joining us now is Hethel Mehta, a senior European economist, legal and general investment management. Great to have you on the program today. I mean, what did you learn from the, the U.S., not inflation number, but actually the, the surrounding commentary yesterday? Um, but clearly, the central bankers are quite worried about the second round effects and how much it's going to take to actually squeeze inflation out of the system, probably looking at really needing a recession to, to get things um, back to kind of target consistent levels. Can, can we get away without a recession actually in the US, given all of the hikes that we've had so far and, get, and given actually the Fed needs to do something to the labor market if you're going to get inflation down to a meaningful target? We don't think you can actually. We think that a recession is necessary. We're looking at something like a one and a half percent peak to trough decline and only then will we start getting inflation maybe next year uh, closer to target but we've got second round effects high wages feeding through there's evidence of that um, and you know central banks have have to be mindful that financial conditions have been loosening and they've been banging the drum that they can't they can't ease off just yet um, and actually the recession is probably needed to, to get all of the inflation out so Hedda, what kind of recession is it going to, to be like a deep and ugly recession because there's maybe over tightening from the Federal Reserve or is it going to be a kind of shallow recession but maybe stays longer than we're expecting it to probably somewhere in the middle um, one and a half percent I think uh, peak to trough would be you know probably on the milder side, certainly milder than what we saw post-financial crisis. Um, and the recovery, though, is going to be slow. We don't expect much in terms of um, employment gains. Um, once we even come out of it, it's going to be a jobless recovery. So, yeah, I'd say you know, middling. <laughs> What if, there's, what if the, the labor market holds on? Again, th there's so much evidence at the moment, and it could change you know, very quickly, that the labor market is tight in the U.S., that it's very difficult to find the right, job, or the right people for the right jobs because of a lack of, of, of skilled workers. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem we're seeing everywhere, including in Europe as well, the shortage of workers trying to, trying to cool the labor market. And we know the labor market's a lagging indicator, but we would have expected by now more cracks to, to have appeared. And that is one part of the puzzle where, you know, it, the resilience has been quite astonishing. Uh, Hetal, we talk a lot about the UK and the fact that we have the, you know, the other problems of the world, certainly the problems that we have in Europe and the US, but distilled and condensed in the UK. Is the situation very similar to other parts of the world? Um, 
some elements are very similar, so tight labour market, deteriorating housing market, um, stagnating GDP. But we have had a confluence of other things in the UK, um, the shortage of workers exacerbated by you know, Brexit and other things. Um, inflation here in the UK still double digits despite, despite the decline. Um, core inflation is coming off, but again, Still, still very high from very high levels. So, what does that? How do you think that the BOE is looking at this? I know, and I've taken a bet. I won't say <laughs> which way I've taken a bet, but you know, the, the March twenty third hike is now mm. in question. Uh, yeah, so I think that that one's going to be quite a close call. So, the, the signal we got from the last meeting was that Bank of England's probably done. They were going to be yep. hyper, hyper data, data sensitive. Yep. The the wage numbers we had yesterday were definitely pushing towards the a rate hike is, is necessary. Today's numbers will be a relief, and I think that's where you know, there's probably going to be quite intense debate on the Bank of England for the rate hike. But more importantly, at the end of the year, I think it's going to be very difficult to see cuts. I mean, in the U.S., you know, if they carry on hiking for longer, it just narrows the window for that about turn in policy. And in the U.K., we think core inflation is going to be so much higher for longer that the Bank of England won't be able to cut, even though after today's numbers, the market's starting to price in a bit more of that. We think it's unlikely. Well, it, it was interesting last time where we were at the Bank of England and to hear them, I guess, you know, move away a bit from the doomsday scenario, mm. but it's actually it's going to take a long time for any kind of meaningful growth to come back. Yeah, it is. And the, the other part of the Bank of England's assessment, which I th thought was really important, is what they're saying about potential growth. So we think, and we agree, that potential growth in the UK is going to be 1% you know, at best. Yeah. Um, it just means you have to have an even bigger downturn in the economy to squeeze inflation out. Um, and so, yes, in the near term, we've had some better data, labour markets holding up, but the medium term assessment is very bleak and, and actually we, we would concur with that. Um, Heather, what are you expecting from ECB? ECB, I mean, they've pre-committed, haven't yeah. they? Again, despite no forward guidance, they've told us, you know, with, with some certainty what they're going to do. So I think, yeah, ne next meeting, it, it's a 50. Thereafter, I think 25, most likely. Um, there's definitely a kind of looking in the rearview mirror, looking at what the Fed's saying um, going on, I think. Um, but yeah, the inflation problem in, in Europe, similar in, in the sense that the energy price shock is still yep. keeping those second round effects going. Um, maybe less tight in terms of the labour market there, but similar problems. Hedel, thank you so much. Hedel Mehta there, Senior European Economist at Legal and General Investment Management. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerns. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Lufthansa says issues with computer systems are leading to widespread flight cancellations. This morning, the German airline has told us it's investigating the matter. Now, Chinese stocks have become a must-have for hedge funds again. Again. The latest 13F filings show they loaded up on the shares last quarter as Beijing abandoned its COVID zero policy. Meanwhile, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway reported an unusually quick reversal in its TSMC position. The legendary investor slashed his holdings of the Taiwanese chip giant just months after disclosing he had actually bought a major stake. Louis Vuitton has named music producer for Well Williams as its new menswear designer filling a role previously held by the late Virgil Abloh. The French brand says Williams will unveil his debut collection at the Paris Men's Fashion Week. That's happening in June. Abloh was Louis Vuitton's star menswear designer before his death from cancer at the age of 41. ASML says a former employee in China misappropriated data about its technology, potentially violating export controls. The Dutch company, the leading maker of high-tech machines, for producing chips, says it reported the breach to authorities and initiated an internal review. It's the second time in as many years that ASML has leveled charges against Chinese entities. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, and this is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up as a fallout from the Adani crisis continues, we take a look at just how intertwined the group is with India's economy. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg.
Now, if you are traveling, I cannot say this enough. Lufthansa says its IT systems have issues and they are causing widespread cancellations. So if you are traveling, check with your airport or travel agent before you show up to the airport. Uh, Lufthansa just about 15 minutes ago saying the company, the company computer systems are leading to some of widespread flight cancellations. Today, the company, we understand from a spokesperson, is investigating the matter. So that's all we know uh, at the moment. Again, it will cause disruption for travelers across Europe. Lufthansa share price currently down 2%. Now, the rise and fall of Adani has demonstrated just how intertwined the company is with India's economy. But business groups want the rest of the world to know India is much bigger than the conglomerate. Yes, hola. Adani is hola. From the rooftop of this house in Shiracha village, Adani dominates the Gujarat skyline. Other than one Tata facility, the rest is all Adani. In 2010, there were three public listed Adani companies. Now there are seven and another five in queue. In the last decade, Adani became India's fastest growing infrastructure conglomerate, with a third of the country's port capacity to the largest piped gas license area. Those are one class infrastructure investments, you know, they, they are very large part percentage of the domestic market in terms of capacity and capabilities. The India infrastructure story is littered with fallen fortunes due to heavy debt financing, delays, bureaucracy and corruption. Credit Suisse red flagged the Adani Group and nine others in its prophetic House of Debt report in 2012. Many on that list have since struggled, but Gautam Adani seemed unstoppable. Friends in high places, a debt-fueled empire, concentrated shareholdings, mysterious investors, and a meteoric gain in Adani's share prices, adding to his controversial rise. Till Hindenburg research struck and scuppered his plan to use high-priced equity to repay debt. The lesson for everyone is that we should be believe in top-class corporate governance and we should be willing to open our records to everyone in the world. And I'm quite sure that Adani's will also bounce back in due course. Foreign lenders that hold close to half the Adani debt are less confident. At least one Adani partner is reviewing future investments and there's fear this may hurt foreign interest in Indian infrastructure, manufacturing and green energy. I think India is a big country with a number of companies and infrastructure investments in India have a huge opportunity. And uh, I, I think foreign and international capital providers recognize that. India is not just Adani, defends a Modi government facing political protests and allegations of crony capitalism. That's partly right. Despite the high debt and still high market capitalization, the Adani Group scandal has so far had no contagion effect though it has prompted a social media wave of nationalistic messages supporting Adani and Indian enterprise. Meanwhile, in Shiracha, Vishal rules the lack of formal jobs in the region, while counting a 6,000 rupee loss on Adani's share investments. In Gujarat, Menika Doshi, Bloomberg News. Coming up, we'll take a look at some of this morning's biggest stock moves from banks to luxury. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, let's wrap some of uh, the big stock news out of Europe this morning. Uh, Louis Vuitton, LVMH's biggest brand, has named music producer Pharrell Williams as its new 
menswear designer. Now, meanwhile, revenue of luxury goods maker Caring plunged, supply disruptions in China, her Gucci sales, and ad controversy hit Balenciaga. And then Barclays on the banking front missed estimates for both fixed income and equities trading. The bank did, though, announce a fresh share buyback of as much as 500 million pounds. So joining us for more on this, Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf is going to talk luxury, and Bloomberg opinion columnist Andrew Felstead is going to talk banks. I'm kidding, guys. Calm down. <laughs> Andrea, um, let, let's talk luxury. I mean, you, you write some beautiful opinion pieces, right, on luxury. And there are two things. First of all, if you look at carrying, it was pretty dismal, actually. Gucci was, uh, you know, not as good as expected, and then they had that whole, whole Balenciaga story. Clearly, there needs to be improvement at Gucci. They have uh, appointed a new designer. Everybody is waiting for him to, yes. you know, really come out with his new designs. It really needs to be rejuvenated, a shot of energy into its fashions, which consumers have got a bit bored with the big logos and the bold colours, the maximalism. OK, so talking about LVMH, this was huge news, right? It was announced yesterday, and this is Louis Vuitton, really the cash cow of the LVMH, with a new chief executive appointing a, a new designer. Exactly. I'm um, surprising again, like the Gucci appointment. Um, sadly, uh, Virgil Abloh died and they had to find a replacement. It seems they have almost sought to replace uh, Virgil Abloh as, as much as possible. History of music, streetwear, um, it, ability yeah. to collaborate. But when, when uh, Virgil Abloh was appointed, it, it felt very new and fresh. Uh, Pharrell Williams yeah. feels like, obviously, he, he's been around a long time. He's been associated with luxury a long time, strong pedigree. But it, it really feels like a safe pair of hands rather than something very new and exciting and, and will that be exciting enough for consumers everybody talks about heritage with luxury yeah. but it's really the constant newness that makes you want to go out and spend a lot of money on a handbag or a pair of sneakers it, it needs that constant energy so that is the question will this have be sufficiently yeah. different and have enough energy to propel those new sales I mean, this is exactly what tom was thinking on that new gucci handbag he was thinking <laughs> is this exciting enough do i go for Lu gucci or louis vuitton it's the big question. It is a big question. It, you, you know, just to go back on what we can expect from um, Pharrell Williams, is this all about collapse? Do they make money? Or, I mean, how big is the Louis Vuitton group in general? Well, the Louis Vuitton um, in general is about 20 billion euros of annual sales. It's, it's the biggest uh, brand in the LVMH stable, and it's really the driver of the fortune. So that has to keep motoring on to keep LVMH going in the right direction. OK, nothing like talking about luxury. The newsroom, the producers are saying, wait, I'd rather Chanel. Um, Tom, thank you for your great luxury contribution. If you look at Barclays, I mean, I'm quite surprised. I know they didn't really, there's nothing good in the results, yeah. but share, their share price is down almost 8%. Yeah, yeah, I think I just saw it come up on screen more than 8.5 now, so really getting dinged. And I think that's the problem, is it's across the board, right? It wasn't just a bad quarter for the investment bank. They kind of missed estimates right across the board. And you mentioned that £500 million buyback. Even that isn't enough. A lot of analysts are saying, that was a bit disappointing. We've seen rivals pay out a lot more. And, you know, I think it's just that sense that right across the bank, there wasn't sort of any standout performance. So what does that mean for how they need to re-strategize going forward? Again, is it because they didn't excel in giving back? They have still half a billion in dividends. Could they have done more? Yeah, I think, uh, as the CEO Venkat, Venkat was saying, it's kind of a unique year because they had those two sort of spectacular flubs, you know, one on the paperwork blow up and one obviously on WhatsApp. And, and as part of that, they actually dinged their bonus pool by about £500 million. And what Venkat was saying, along with other executives, was like, look, this is a one-off. We're doing everything we can to make sure this never happens again. And if you can strip those out, you know, the bank is in good health. Is there anything that else that we should be looking out for? So there's also the bonus pool at Barclays with a lot of the cuts to a lot of senior management. What, like, what happens to Barclays in the next two to three months? Well, it's really interesting, right? For the last few quarters, it's been a really positive story around that massive investment bank they have. And this is the first quarter in a while that it hasn't quite sort of delivered and almost acted as ballast for the rest of the bank. So I think it's, you know, they're set on this strategy. It has worked in, in very recent quarters. Yeah. And I think they're just hoping for a, a rebound next quarter. You know why we got you together? Talk about banking luxury, but also really talk China. Like, how's China sales doing? This was the big... It was interesting to see that, that Caring didn't manage to make up for that slowdown in China, but LVMH and Richemont did. 
China had a terrible, the, the fourth quarter was terrible for China. The hope now is that uh, consumers come out and start spending again. That will be the biggest driver for luxury this year. The US has really powered the industry for the last couple of years. But there are signs that's slowing. They really need China to pick up that bling baton to keep them going through this year. But Andrew, if you look at margins, I mean, the luxury, I mean, banks dream of these kind of margins, <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. Because it, it, they just, I, mean, I think Chanel was hiking prices is by 30%. Like, how much longer can they do this kind of hike? This is the question. I think if the Chinese consumer comes back, they can probably keep hiking. If it's down to domestic consumers, particularly the US, where there are pressures, particularly on that sort of lower lux the lower tier luxury consumer, they're, they're suffering from inflation, high costs like everybody else. There is a point where they won't physically or metaphorically wear higher prices. I mean, wouldn't it be fun to swap like the chief executives from a bank to a luxury company <laughs> and vice versa? Tom, what's the biggest concern for a lot of the banks? And, and you see clear winners and losers. In a rising interest rate environment, like what are you looking for? Yeah, I, th I think it's those expanding margins, right? And across the UK banks, which are all coming up out over the next few days, it'd be really interesting to see if anyone's able to sort of really sort of push their profit margins further. That's what a lot of investors were thinking about. But actually, when you look at the results today, it's not been a massive improvement. So it's that outlook uh, and, of course, kind of any sort of thing around bonuses and, yeah. and job cuts. All right, thank you both for joining us for a spirited conversation on two interesting industry groups. Tom Metcalf covering banking or Bloomberg opinions. Andrea Felstead, who covers luxury. Now, we're also getting some breaking news, and this happened about 20 minutes ago. Deutsche Lufthansa is saying that they had issue with some of their com company computer systems, and that's leading to widespread flight cancellations today. Now, we understand. We hit the phones. We spoke to the spokesperson of the German airline by phone, and she said the company is investigating the matter. So we don't have that much news on the back of it, share price is down 1.8 percent. If you need to go to the airport, if you're flying to or from anywhere, just check with your airline or call the airport ahead of that to make sure that you don't get stranded at the airport for hours like sometimes it happens. The picture overall for markets is one of cautious optimism. We do look at the inflation boogeyman, what that means for inflation services. We had U.S. inflation yesterday. We had U.K. inflation today. And then the other big story is, for example, Glencore paying out some $7.1 billion. This is thanks to coal. It'll be interesting over the next couple of weeks and months to see what a lot of ESG conscious shareholders do with Glencore. Now that's it for Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. It continues in the next hour with Matt Miller in New York, Anna Edwards in London, and this is Bloomberg. Inflation is still too high. Inflation's still here. Uh, the economy is still strong. And I think they have to decide how to play it. The most likely scenario, and I give it 50%, is that we end up with sticky inflation, 3 to 4%. I am confident that the gears of monetary policy will continue to move in a way that will bring inflation down to 2%. We will stay the course until our job is done. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. CPI aftermath, investors digest U.S. and U.K. inflation data, and the likelihood of interest rates staying higher for longer. Following the big money, Warren Buffett sends an ominous signal on TSMC, while Sam Druckenmiller ditches tech stocks. And Elon Musk says he may need the rest of this year to make Twitter financially healthy before handing it off to a new CEO. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards. 
Markets in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, the markets took quite a while and actually came to different conclusions based on different asset classes as to what it meant, that CPI print yesterday. So already, uh, well, it seems to still be something that the market is having to think about and digest, adding to that other global inflation around the stickiness of inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And um, not just different asset classes, but different industry groups, right? Because yesterday in the cash trade here in the U.S., we had the NASDAQ closing higher, more than half a percent higher, um, while the S&P 500 was unchanged and the Dow finished down. So um, I guess it depends on what kind of stock you are, growth versus uh, value, maybe big company versus small company, uh, tech stock versus uh, car maker um, determines how you did with that inflation print yesterday. Take a look at what we're seeing today. S&P futures are off about a third of 1%. Now we closed just about here in the cash trade, 41, I want to say 41.35, 41.36. Um, so still 15, 16% higher than the October lows. The rally, I guess, is alive and well. The U.S. 10-year yield coming down just a bit, but it's higher than it was at this point yesterday. So when we looked at it yesterday, it was at I think 369 and change were about three basis points higher than that. Um, and that is a bit of a headwind for stocks, right? When you get a higher yield um, from uh, zero risk assets than you do uh, stocks, you tend to want to get into those. The U.S. dollar index climbing back up a little bit higher today, and we see it higher against, I'll show the yen in a second, but also the pound and, um, and, and the euro at 1239.20 on the U.S. dollar index. And then NYMEX crude down now $1.11. So not as bad as it was uh, just about a half hour ago. We were down almost 2% on West Texas Intermediate, but still continuing to fall because this is um, a, a, a really a telltale sign of the concern that investors have for global growth. If we don't see it, you won't see the demand, and as a result, you have lower prices uh, across the oil complex. In terms of the Asian finish overnight, we had the MSCI Asia Pacific down about 1.2%, and the Hang Seng, one of the biggest losers, off uh, one one and a half percent. You can see the Nikkei didn't do nearly as poorly, down about four tenths of a percent in Japan, and there you see the U.S. dollar showing some strength at the end. You can now buy 133. Uh, 0.3 yen for one U.S. dollar. What do you see in Europe now as far as reaction, I guess, to not only the inflation story here that we saw here yesterday, but also that you have in the U.K.? Yeah, absolutely. So we had the inflation print mid-session yesterday from the U.S. perspective, uh, mid-session here in Europe then, Matt. So we had some time to factor that in, but we continue to think about where the inflation story gets, gets us. And I'll come to the U.K. side of things in just a moment. This is what we have on European stocks right now. A real divergent performance across a number of sectors. So if you're really exposed to real estate or to basic resources, then you're not doing so well. So the London market is fairly flat today. If you're really exposed to uh, the consumer and to grocery stores and to some of the luxury names, then you're not doing too badly, up by nine tenths of one percent over in the, the Cat Care Arms. And actually, the names in the grocery section, such as Arhol Del, Del Hayes and Carful, doing really well on better than anticipated results in the grocery space. That's what we're seeing across the map. This is one of the big names in Paris, of course, doing well today in the luxury space, up by 3.9 percent on, uh, on caring, bouncing. They had a sales slump in China, but it does seem as if in, in, uh, investors are choosing to look through that sales slump, also yeah. looking through the difficulties they had with one of their ad campaigns related to the Balenciaga brand, which they have said has had an impact on the business, but investors choosing to look through both of those things and send the share price a little bit higher, focusing on the reopening story, it seems, in China, which looks more positive. Barclays down by 8.7% for this uh, UK bank, of course, with a substantial investment banking presence. Uh, and really, they disappointed across the board. When it came to the numbers, all kinds of numbers that the market estimates, the numbers actually came in worse than that. And even though they introduced a buyback, it, it was seen as fairly small compared to some people's expectations. So Barclays down 8.7%. Glencore in the mining space, fairly flat right now. We heard from them around their coal and trading business. Uh, they've seen record profits at the company driven by the trading business, the coal business, all of that doing very nicely for them. And returning cash to shareholders, certainly a theme when it comes to this particular uh, business. They were going to be returning more than $7 billion in dividends and buybacks to investors. And this is the pound, 120.91. It is quite weak today, down by 7 tenths of 1%. But this actually to do with the inflation print here in the UK. So we've had this inflation number came in at 10 
10.1%. That wasn't 10.3, which had been estimated. So it's still, of course, ludicrously <laughs> high by anybody's estimates, uh, anybody's uh, estimation. But it isn't as high as had been expected. More on that with Valerie Titel shortly. And I just wanted to mention a, a red headline across the Bloomberg in the last few minutes. Scotland's Nicola Sturgeon, this is according to BP, uh, BBC reports, I should say, only that source at the moment, is to resign as First Minister of Scotland. She, a leading light, of course, in the Scottish independence campaign. No doubt that continues whether she is there or not. We'll wait for any confirmation around her future plans. And the pound is pretty unmoved right now by that news, Matt. All right. Um, any reason as to why? Is she just, has she had enough? Uh, well, we'll look for further details. We'll actually look to see whether this is the case. I mean, it is, as I say, just one, uh, just one report at the moment. There's been some quite, uh, there's been criticism of the way she's mixed handling of Scottish independence with certain other domestic social issues. Culture wars have been in the mix as well. And so whether that has, uh, has some bearing on it, we'll see. All right. Uh, interesting indeed. Let's get back, though, to the big inflation story after the CPI uh, uh, in the U.S. rose briskly yesterday with the annual headline rate and core measures both coming in hotter than expected. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin spoke exclusively with us here at Bloomberg Television after the report. We may or may not uh, choose to take rates up further if inflation continues to persist, but we'll have to see what happens. If inflation settles, uh, maybe we don't go quite as far, but if inflation persists, at levels well above our, our target, maybe we'll have to do more. Valerie Titel has been tracking the market response, and Valerie, as Anna said earlier, um, it's been a bit up and down in terms of how markets are, 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 are receiving this information um, and, and looking at it. Yeah, definitely, Matt, especially right after that number came out. I mean, the swing was wild. Uh, it, it ended up, uh, two-year two -year yields almost rallied 10 basis points right after that number came out. But as the day went on, the yields tracked higher. In fact, if we look at how the two-year yield has moved since that hot uh, payroll print on February 3rd, it's risen nearly 50 basis points. In fact, uh, a fun fact about this, the S&P over that same time frame is in the green. It's just been quite a confusing market for someone to figure out. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into what's been going in the front end. If we look at the euro dollar curve, which is the uh, front end rates and how they've traded since that hot payroll print, the curve has shifted up and out, meaning the peak rate is now seen later in the year and at a higher level. In fact, the markets are now pricing uh, e even odds that we could get a hike in June. That would take the Fed funds rate to five and a half. Right, indeed. So that's the way that the U.S. conversation is shifting. What about the U.K. dynamic then, uh, Valerie? This is an interesting one. We've seen uh, gilt yields reacting to this. We've seen the pound reacting to this. A reassessment of the extent to which we get hikes from the Bank of England as a result of CPI that's still really high but came in below estimate. Yeah, I think the Fed might be jealous of this report out of the UK today. It was broadly soft. That was across headline and core. And there was a sharp fall in services inflation, which is going to be a welcome sign for the Bank of England, Anna. This comes after we had a hot wage inflation data yesterday that was uh, in their unemployment release in the UK. So it's a good sign for the Bank of England after that worrying uh, wage inflation data yesterday. And in fact, we have seen two-year yields take it in stride, rallying almost 13 basis points this since this print. I want to note that they were dragged higher yesterday given the, the sell-off in the, in the U.S. front end, but they seem to be taking this report in stride and cable is lower uh, in sympathy. All right, Valerie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel there walking us through the inflation data on both sides of the Atlantic. Now let's get to uh, a U.S., um, well, I guess Western world uh, versus China story. Dutch chipmaker ASML says a former employee in China stole data about its proprietary technology and that export controls may have been violated. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's April Roach in Amsterdam. So April, you know, with tensions between the West and China at a heightened level, um, this is not great news. What do we know about the alleged misappropriation of data? Yes. So as you said, ASML said um, a now former employee in China stole data about its proprietary technology. The semiconductor equipment maker said it is investigating the misappropriation of confidential information and that it has informed the relevant authorities. And ASML made these comments in its annual statement where it highlighted that it has seen increasing security risk trends such as phishing attacks and attempts to steal its intellectual property property and also said that this incident may have violated certain export control regulations. 
uh, and, and what is the impact on ASML's business then from all of that? So currently there's not much known about the incident. There's still a lot of uncertainty surrounding the details. And ASML said it did not make an earlier statement about this incident because it does not see a material impact on its business from what happened. However, the fact that it did highlight that certain uh, export control regulations may have been violated suggests that this could perhaps be more severe than what we expect. It's also good to note that this is not the first time that ASML has leveled charges against against Chinese entities. Last year, it accused a Beijing-based firm of attempting to steal trade secrets. All right, April, thanks very much. April Roach covers ASML for us out of Amsterdam, walking us through the details of that story. Now, the latest 13F filing show Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway reported an unusually quick reversal in his TSMC position. The legendary investor slashed his holding of the Taiwanese chip giant just months after disclosing he'd bought a major stake. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta comes in early and gives us the details of these 13F filings. Kriti, what do we know? Yeah, just for you, Matt. Uh, this is a really important story when it comes <laughs> that to That sounded sarcastic. I mean, well, it's really for Anna. Let's be completely <laughs> <Okay>. honest. But um, <laughs> but I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll rope you in as well. Uh, let's talk about Warren Buffett here. Look, he's a long-term investor. We know he makes these really big uh, kind of stakes on things like Coca-Cola, railroads, most uh, recently Occidental, and his big call on oil right now. He made a call on TSMC only back in November to with a stake of about five billion dollars and apparently sold it fairly quickly too, Matt, as you pointed out. If you look at the average price over the period, the stake sale would have been about $3.7 billion. But context is everything here. So even though on the surface it looks like it is a loss, it's really important to keep in mind what the chip makers have really done, especially in that uh, in December when you did have a lot of the kind of geopolitics of the chip sector really come to the forefront. It wasn't just Warren Buffett that actually pulled out of the entire chips index. A lot of this has to do with the fund flows that you saw out of uh, semiconductors broadly. And this really comes down once again to geopolitics. Remember, in the last couple of months, in the fourth quarter specifically, uh, you did actually have uh, President Biden introduce a lot more plants that were going to come become more operational here in the States when it comes to chip making capacity. Also, uh, working with the likes of Japan and the Netherlands, as you pointed out, uh, with ASML, and working on what those chip exports actually look like. And that has cr created a little bit of a spooking factor for a lot of investors who were actually pretty uh, deep into the semiconductor space purely on the idea that it chips are in everything and that's an inflationary bet. Mm. And, and Chrissy, good morning to you. Thank you very much for coming in to talk to us about these stories. And, and let me ask you about Stan Druckenmiller and the Duquesne family office because we've also seen an exit from certain tech names there. We have. And, you know, it's interesting when we talk about chip stocks, it kind of feels like the one big heavyweight you have to watch is NVIDIA. So I'm going to start there. Uh, when we talk about what Drunken Miller actually bet on, this massive bet on NVIDIA, about 4% of his entire $2 billion portfolio is now just in this one company. And remember, this is the heavyweight, which I should mention in the last week or so has actually been leading a lot of the tech games right next to Tesla. So this is kind of a story not only on the EV side of things that you're getting a lot of government uh, spending and government kind of incentives on, but also on the idea of chat GPT, AI intelligence, data warehouses. If you're a, bit a believer in kind of this innovation and innovative technology, think the metaverse, for example, AI, whatever you want to rope into that. NVIDIA has been kind of at the heart of it as they look to diversify their own business. So that's been a major bet. But on the other hand, they have exited a lot of some of the major companies. Think Microsoft, uh, think Amazon. And they're kind of the only ones to do so because in the last four, in the last quarter, when Drunken Miller uh, or Drunken Miller, excuse me, exited those uh, companies, you did have the likes of Lone Pine upping their stake of Microsoft by about 23%. It's now the fourth biggest holding for Tiger Global. And even Amazon, uh, Baupost Group, tripled their stake. So it kind of feels like Drunken Miller's going against the uh, curve here. So family offices basically out of the tech trade, right. hedge funds in, but Drunken Miller is still with a big win on NVIDIA because that has almost doubled from its, no, it's more than doubled from its October lows if I look uh, the low at 111 and now it's at 229. Exactly. Kriti, thank you very much. Kriti Gupta there with some of the details on the 13Fs. Take a look at some of the stocks we're watching in the pre-market today. Airbnb beat estimates with its outlook for revenue in the first quarter. That signals travel demand remains robust even after the record year for growth uh, in the post-COVID 2022. Airbnb said sales could reach $1.82 billion dollars in the three months ending March, and that easily clears analysts' average estimates of $1.68 billion. Let's take a look also at 
Devon Energy shares fell uh, in the post market and now are down in the pre market almost 7%. The oil producer reported fourth quarter core EPS that fell short of the average analyst estimate. The company also said CapEx will be more than 3.6 billion, could be 3.8 billion, and analysts are expecting spending of 3.4 billion. Um, so costs need to be kept under control, says Wall Street. Ford, which is keeping costs under control. Remember yesterday, they said 3,800 people are gone across Europe. Um, now they have temporarily halted production and stopped shipments of the hot-selling F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck. There's an unidentified problem with the battery. The automaker confirmed Tuesday that it stopped building the plug-in pickup at its factory in Dearborn. And um, even if those shipments are underway, for example, if your Lightning that you ordered is on the way to the dealer, you won't be able to pick it up. So I know how bad that is, waiting for your truck. It's a big <laughs> bummer. But the problems continue. You have a lot of empathy for those in that situation, yes. I, I can feel, Matt. Right, coming up on the program, back to the macro conversation. Freya Beamish joins us, T.S. Lombard, chief economist. What kind of recession does she see in the United States? What kind of reopening in China? We'll also talk about Musk as he gives himself the year. The Twitter CEO says he'll be handling over the reins by the end of 2023. More details ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. CPI aftermath. Investors digest US and UK inflation data and the likelihood of interest rates staying higher for longer. Following the big money, Warren Buffett sends an ominous signal on TSMC while Stan Druckenmiller ditches tech stocks. And Elon Musk says he may need the rest of this year to make Twitter financially healthy before handing it over to a new CEO. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, it seemed that equity markets yesterday were trying their best to look on the bright side when it came to that inflation print and what that might mean for Fed policy today, though, not so much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we even rallied into that number. So we're now at 15, 16 percent from the October lows. And we haven't really let much air out of that rally, even after we got um, uh, the, 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 the Fed talk yesterday, um, four Fed speakers, at least by my count, saying we may have to see further uh, hikes, um, a higher terminal rate. So right now we're looking at S&P futures that are down about four tenths of one percent. Uh, so a little bit of air let out of that. But you can see yields at 373 offer a pretty good um, uh, competition to S&P uh, yields. So another headwind here and the Bloomberg dollar index rising which adds more pressure um, to a sell-off at the open this morning in just about four hours from now. NYMEX crude also down $1.15. It had been down a little bit more, almost 2% earlier, but we see oil across the um, uh, uh, across the spectrum down this morning, whether you're talking about Brent or West Texas Intermediate, as concerns persist about um, the global growth situation. We also see a lot of individual stock stories today. Airbnb won on the positive side. It beat estimates with its outlook for revenue in the first quarter, signaling travel demand remains robust even after a record year for growth in 2022. So that continues, and I know you've got a lot of good news for the most part uh, about consumer stocks over there as well. Devon Energy uh, here, those shares fell yesterday in the post market. They're down in the pre market as well, 7% right now after the oil maker uh, reported fourth quarter core EPS that fell short of the average analyst estimate and says spending is going to be higher. CapEx will be between 3.6 and 3.8 billion. Analyst estimate was for 3.4 billion, um, and that's a concern, obviously for investors. Ford, which yesterday said it's going to cut 3,800 jobs across Europe in its shift to EVs, now says that it stopped shipments of its hot-selling EV pickup truck, the F-150 Lightning. Um, there's an unidentified problem with the battery, and even if they're on the way to the dealer and you've ordered one, you're not going to be able to pick it up until um, they figure that out. Anna, what do you see in terms of the European trade? 
Well, the be the uh, the strength we saw earlier on, Matt, in European trade fading just a little bit. We're up, but only by a tenth of a percent. So pretty flat, really, across the European equity market space. Still digesting that inflation data of yesterday. We've had some strong reports coming out of some grocery businesses, uh, our whole Del Hayes, Carrefour, and the like, all on the rise quite substantially, actually, uh, because of the performance that they've delivered. But some of the early gains, as I say, for European stocks have been fading. Barclays is one of the negatives today, down by just shy of 10 percent. In fact, this is the business uh, reports numbers for the last quarter that seemed to show it missed estimates across the board, uh, across a whole range of metrics from fixed income trading to equities trading uh, to other metrics that uh, the analyst community look at. It seemed as if there was a lot of room for disappointment. And even though they announced a buyback, it wasn't necessarily uh, higher than had been expected or even in line. Glencore, on the other hand, $7 billion worth, more than $7 billion worth of money being returned to shareholders in dividends and in buybacks. Uh, so that's part of the story there. This is a business, of course, that's been doing very well off its trading arm, in particular trading costs. Uh, the pound is at 120.90, and this really, the move, is very much attached to the inflation data we had out earlier on today. It came in at 10.1%, the estimate was for 10.3%, and it's a drop down from 10.5% the previous month. So it's still double digits, still really high inflation, but it's not as high as had been expected. And so expectations around the BOE just shifting a little bit. We're also watching domestic politics. Uh, the First Minister in Scotland then, Matt, has called a press conference for the top of the next hour, uh, and the domestic media reporting here in the UK that this is because she plans to resign. She's under quite a lot of pressure at the moment because her party, the SNP, has been fading in the polls of late. Right. And she's been in there for, what, already about nine years, I believe. So yeah. it's been a long run for Nicola Sturgeon. We look forward to the press conference to find out exactly the details of what's happening. Let's get back, though, to the economy. Joining us now is Freya Bemis, chief economist at TS Lombard. And Freya, um, we're all trying to figure out, I think... You know, why the, the markets um, continue to rally in, in some senses, right? We're still up 15% from the October lows, even though there are increasing signs that the Fed's going to have to rate, uh, raise rates further and hold them high for longer. What's your view? I think what the equity market is is worried about at this stage is is recession and that we're going to continue to see down earnings downgrades on the back of, of weaker growth. And I do actually think that we could get some more scares in that direction. But sort of taking a step back here, I think in a sense what the Fed is doing is, is quite sensible. And I think markets in a way, they sort of see that. So what the Fed is doing is that they're recognizing that there's there's all of these different um, shocks that are being digested, different cycles that are in play, and they're feeling their way towards a necessary slowdown. And I do think the slowdown um, to a degree is necessary to knock out the COVID type distortions in inflation and to bring that process to its conclusion, digesting through the snake, if you like. Mm. Um, but they're probably, we think the Fed is probably going to switch towards a more dovish stance as it starts to see the economy um, starting to, to rebalance. So that's code for saying okay. they're not going to chase unemployment up towards above 4.5%. It may, it may rise that far, but they're not going to chase it higher in order to push uh, inflation back down in a Phillips curve type sense. OK, do you think there is a risk, Freya, that we see a resurgence in inflation? Is that, is that a possibility? In particular, you know, you follow the Chinese reopening story uh, very closely. Is that going to be inflationary for the rest of the world? Or maybe not because it's about Chinese services and not about factory floor inflation? Yeah, a big picture here is that I think that inflation over the, the post-COVID cycle is actually going to be higher than in the, in the 2010s. So kind of 3% or, or above rather than below 2%. But right now, 2023 is sort of like the year in between. We're digesting the, the, the shocks through, through COVID. Um, that's passing through core goods. Um, a bit of a shock in, in uh, a bit of a, a heat in, in January still in the U.S. inflation data in core goods. But the, the likelihood is that if the economy slows, that will can continue. We'll continue to see disinflation in core goods and that, that will gradually feed into into services, um, services as well. So we are still at the moment viewing January um, data as a, as a sort of a statistical blip. Um, but the trend in, in towards disinflation was nascent, uh, and therefore we do have to be a little bit humble here. And if we step back and look at the, the China, China is the, one of the kind of the major shocks to the system mm. this 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 um, this year. Um, the reopening um, 
in the first half of the year, we are expecting Chinese growth to be strong. But yes, as you say, it's much more focused on services. So it's not a normal type of Chinese reopening, either in terms of what it implies for inflation or in terms of what it implies for goods. And when I look at the, the okay. leading indicators for China, the second half of the year looks much slower. Liquidity growth is just simply not there in order to support a continuation of the recovery for, from China. OK, and so when you look at the US, back to that side of things, and you expect to see a mild recession in the United States, Freya, when do you expect that to kick in with these data prints that show robustness in the labour market, even when there are cracks or uh, resilience in the inflation print, even when certain elements are falling? Does it make you think that uh, perhaps the recession is being, being pushed out into the future? How long until we get there? It could be. So we, we're very much looking out for the February and March numbers to see whether that was a statistical blip, blip in January. And if it um, if it was, then perhaps we'll have to push it back a little bit, a little bit more. But I have sort of three basic assumptions. One is that the change in interest rates, the rapidity of the change in interest rates is enough to bring about a temporary slowing in growth. Um, the second is that growth can slow without a major uptrend in in, um, in unemployment. So there's a little bit of decoupling there between the labor market and the the, the growth numbers. And the third is that despite um, unemployment perhaps not rising uh, as much as you would expect in a recession, recessionary environment, you still can get services inflation coming back down if the economy starts to, to slow. And I think that the, the numbers looking beyond the, the labor market, looking at uh, deterioration in supply and demand for credit, looking at the potential for uh, a mild inventory uh, cycle beginning, looking at uh, the rise in, in real rates as a result of inflation coming down. There's enough in there to bring about a bit of a slowdown in the in the middle of the year, Freya. although it doesn't translate so much into the labor market. Freya, the Fed has already raised uh, rates by, what, 450, 475 basis points. And, you know, we're only down 15 percent in that period on the S&P 500. We've got 3.4 percent unemployment. Um, financial conditions are pretty loose and you've got inflation still running hot. I mean, after all that, um, they've got nothing to show for their rate hikes. How much higher do they have to go? Um, I think they do have something to show for, for the rate hikes in terms of, of inflation having having started to, to, to slow in terms of three month annualized rates. OK, January, it goes in the opposite direction. But as I said, that seems we're at the moment still taking that as a, as a blip rather than uh, rather than the trend, uh, albeit with a bunch of humble pie because of because of the, that, that being a nascent trend. Um, but I think we do have we have the beginnings of a slowdown in inflation and we have beyond the labor market, the beginnings of the slowdown in, in growth numbers before the January. Uh, remember, before that January burst in NFP, that was the, the, the narrative. And there's a lot of statistical stuff that goes on in, in January that we have to be be careful about sort of throwing out that entire narrative of, of slowing growth and inflation just based on, on one print. I'm perfectly prepared to, to eat humble pie um, if those statistical uh, numbers do not start to, to or the statistical uh, factors do not start to reverse in, in February and March. And our base case mm. is very much to the upside and has been since sort of midway through last year. We've been very, very much saying that the Fed would have to do more than markets would, would expect. Um, and that it's okay. going to take a lot to slow this economy down because it's the asset side of the balance sheet that is is driving the story, not the, the liability side. So you have to do more in order to destroy wealth than you would in terms of just raising interest rates if people were focused on the liability side of their balance sheet. So that's the kind Freya, of the, 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 the tilt here. Thank you very much for joining us, Freya Beamish of TS Thanks. Lombard. Just want to update you on one of our uh, evolving stories, and this to do with Lufthansa. You remember earlier they grounded all their flights after a computer system uh, failure. Well, it seems we're now getting some insight as to what caused this. Lufthansa, uh, Lufthansa's IT issues were caused by Deutsche Telekom cutting a cable. This uh, coming Oops. to us, uh, I think, from Lufthansa themselves. The Lufthansa share price recovering a little bit. The Deutsche Telekom share price, as you might expect, uh, moving a little bit lower, but not by much as a result of that. So, uh, coming up, Elon Musk says he needs uh, until the end of the year to put things right at Twitter before handing it over to a new CEO. More details ahead. This is Bloomberg.